So, 2 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to read uh, from verse 1. 2 Kings 18, and from verse 1. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the asher, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but he kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. Wherever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from Watchtower to Fortified City. In the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years he took it. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, which was the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. The king of Assyria carried the Israelites away to Assyria and put them in Hala and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, their God, but transgressed his covenant, even all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. They neither listened nor obeyed. In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria, Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. And the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorposts that Hezekiah, the king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabsaris and the Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to king Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. When they arrived, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool which is on the highway to the washer's field. Amen. We'll read on later on in the message. We're going to think about this King Hezekiah over these next three Wednesday nights. And we've got a background about Hezekiah. First of all, he's the son of Ahaz. And Ahaz, you'll remember in the prophet Isaiah, we're in the days of Isaiah, and these Sundays we're going to be looking at some of the prophecies of Isaiah. And so it's around the same time. And Isaiah came to Ahaz and said, ask the Lord for a sign. And he wouldn't ask the Lord for a sign. And Ahaz, or, sorry, Isaiah then said to him, the sign will be the virgin will be with child. But that king Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, was a particularly wicked and idolatrous king. He did horrendous things. He even sacrificed one of his sons on an offering to a false god. He did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And so that makes the story of Hezekiah, who as we will see is a really good king, even more amazing. That out of that badness, good would come. Uh, he reigned from the age of 25 to a relative young man, and he reigned for 29 years. So he reigned in the year 715, to 686 BC. So he reigned about a hundred years before Jerusalem would be destroyed. And in the sixth year of his reign, <coughs> excuse me, the Assyrians came and took 
northern Israel. Remember how Israel had to be divided into ten tribes in the north, their capital Samaria, the much bigger nation, but only two tribes remained faithful to David's family in the south, and those tribes were Judah and Benjamin. So in the sixth year of his reign, the Assyrians took, after several years of siege, they took Samaria and took the people of northern Israel, took them into exile, and they would never return. So he's king, a king in very troubled days. Now as we look at this chapter, the first thing I want to see is his encouraging start in verses 3 to 8. He is described as a king who did what was right in God's eyes. There in verse 3. And you know that is always something we need to be thinking about regarding ourselves. Are we people who do what is right in God's eyes? Are we maybe more concerned about pleasing others or more concerned about just what suits us than pleasing the Lord? Well, this was a king who did what was right in the Lord's eyes. He was very serious. It says in verse 4, he removed the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the answer. He destroyed the places of false worship, of idol worship. Now, when you read through the book of Kings, even about the kings who did what was right in God's eyes, often a wee caveat is put in, but they did not remove the high places. Hezekiah wasn't like that. He went the whole way. He not only removed the high places, the place of false worship, and had a determined plan to do that, he also destroyed the bronze stake. Do you remember the story of the children of Israel in the wilderness? And they rebelled against God. God sent poisonous snakes. And they were dying. And then Moses was told to lift up a bronze snake. To make a bronze snake and lift it up. And by looking at them, people will be saved. It's, it's quoted in John chapter 3. About the snake being lifted up in the same way the Son of Man would be lifted up. But that bronze snake then was worshipped by the people. And it shouldn't be worshipped. God alone should be worshipped. And so, so serious was Hezekiah. He had that snake destroyed, that bronze snake destroyed. So the people would not do that. The true worship of God was important to him. And if you read Second uh, Chronicles chapters 29 to 31, which goes in even greater detail, there we read about how he cleansed the temple he repaired the temple he restored the worship of god he restored the passover feast he reorganized the whole priesthood here was a man who was so determined to go back to the word and to be faithful to his god i love the way it says in verse 5 and 6 he, he trusted in the lord and in verse 6 he held fast to the lord and did not depart from his commands and the result of his faithfulness we see verse 78 he knew success whatever he did he prospered he was able to rebel against the king of Assyria he was enabled to defeat the Philistines the Lord was with him and blessed him in a wonderful way and here we we have great encouragement as to how things can change and be better than what went before you think of his father, who was a godless king, who did not trust the Lord. The Lord sent out overtures to him through Isaiah, seeking to call him to be faithful, but he didn't do it. He was bad, he was wicked, he was evil. And yet out of that comes this godly king. I think, as we mentioned about his mother there, and I think it's through his mod mother. Uh, I haven't researched this, but I think it's through the mother. There was that godly influence in his life. And in many ways why he was the king that he was. But I just want to think about that wee minute. And the wee question is, why do we often struggle to believe things can change for the better? I think so often we, we look at things, whether in our own life, in our families, or the situation in our church, and we think, Things are maybe not that good. They aren't as good as we'd like them to be. And we have an expectation that they can get better. And I think one of the problems is often we, we just look at things as we see them. We look with sight rather than by faith. When we have a vision of a great God, 
an exalted God, God who is high and rules over everything, as Hezekiah had, then we can see that things can really change. So let's look at situations we're not content with, situations which we want to be better. We look at decline in numbers in the church. We look at decline of people generally in our society who are of interest in the things of God. We think of godlessness. Remember 160 years ago was the time of the revival. That's the way things were. And yet God stepped in. We need to have an expectation of what God can do. So the encouraging start that we see here in Hezekiah's reign. And then we have the imposing enemy. Look in verses 9 to 17. So in the fourth year of his reign, the larger northern kingdom came under attack from the king of the Assyrians, who at that time was Shalmaneser. And two years later, it falls. And all the people, Israelite people, people from the tribes of Dan and Naphtali and so forth, these people are all taken into exile. Eight years then pass from that, and Judah comes under attack from what is seems to be an even more powerful king. The king now is Sennacherib, the king of, As of Assyria. Assyria, probably today around the, the Tigers, Euphrates, the Iran area, Nineveh, the capital where Jonah went to. So this great king comes in from there. He takes many of these fortified towns and cities of Judah, and initially Hezekiah tries to buy off the king with silver and gold from the temple and from his own, uh, his own resources. Uh, and I just wondered, nothing is commented upon about this in, in this passage, but I wonder, was this right? Was this a, a lack of faith, the silver and the gold, taking it out of the temple of the Lord? It's not commented upon, but what it does show is this was a, a king who was in a terrible bind and really was at his wit's end, the situation that was coming upon him. But it didn't work. Even though he gives all the silver and gold he has to the, the king of Assyria, still his army comes right to the Jerusalem. And if we see that in verse 17, and we read about certain officials that come and come to speak to him. So we have this imposing enemy. And then we have his discouraging visitors in verses 18 to 25. And let's read this wee passage together uh, from verse 18. And when they called for the king, there came out to them Elikaman, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna the secretary, and Joel, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And the Rabshakeh said to them, said to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria. On what do you rest your trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against us? Behold, you are trusting now in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if he said to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses. If you're able on your part to set riders on them, how then can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants, when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen. Moreover, is it without the Lord that I come up against the place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. So, not exactly very encouraging. So we have this delegation of three officials mentioned here of Assyria. And they're met by three of Hezekiah's officials. And really the plan here is to cause Hezekiah to lose hope by discounting the different things he could trust in. To mention Egypt. And often what would happen 
when a country would be under attack, they'd make an agreement with another country and they would come and support them. And so often what happened with Assyria coming in, nations would call upon Egypt to help. And he basically says, Egypt is like a, a flimsy reed or staff. You, put, you try and put your weight on it, it'll just break and it'll hurt you. Egypt's of no use. And he basically says to them, listen, we'll give you the chariots if you can basically put the people in it to ride and to form an army. And he basically says then, why do you trust in the Lord? And look at that verse 22. It's very interesting there. He says, but if you say we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying, to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. And so his basic argument is, you take away, you take away all those places of worship. Well, they weren't places of true worship. But you took away those places of worship. How do you expect God to come and to defend you? It shows an absolute ignorance. He, he didn't understand that the Lord had commanded that he was to be worshipped in Jerusalem alone. That was to be the place of worship, the place of sacrifice. And so what he was thinking, what, because there wasn't this activity, the Lord wouldn't be pleased. And so he is basically equating faithfulness to God just with a, an outward show of worship. When faithfulness to the Lord is not by, about an outward show of worship, it's about obedience to the Lord and his commands. There is this mockery going on, and all of this he's seeking to diminish the king. He, he's seeking to discourage the king. He's seeking to lose hope, cause the king to lose hope. Look at verse 25. What, and just why does he mention the Lord here? More, moreover, it is, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. And so he's basically saying to Hezekiah, I'm the Lord's servant. I'm doing the Lord's will in doing this. And all behind this is basically the desire that Hezekiah and the people of Israel will lose the sense of being God's special people. The apple of God's eye. He's basically saying God is not for you. God is is against you. I was reading a really encouraging book oh, when I was away the last few weeks, Enjoying God by Tim Chester. I find anything by Tim Chester very thought-provoking and helpful. And one of the things in that book about enjoying God is, is uh, he puts it something basically along this line. I remember an elder in Moy put this to me. He says, uh, God loves you, but do you think he likes you? Uh, and that also is a very interesting thing. But basically what Tim Chester in his book is telling us just how God delights in his people. He delights in his people's praise. He delights in his people's company. And basically, we need to grasp how much the Lord loves us and delights in us. We will never truly enjoy God as we should if we don't realise how much he truly does adore us and what he has done for us. And basically what is happening here is these officials are wanting Hezekiah to doubt God's love and God's delight in his people. And you think about that. If you doubt God's love and delight in you, it will totally change the way you pray. You'll pray to a God who you'll see as cold or distant or harsh. Whereas if you are aware of his love, his joy and his delight in your presence, you pray to a God who you know loves to answer your prayers. So this is what he's seeking to do. To get Hezekiah to doubt the Lord's faithfulness towards him. And then we go on to our final point, which is his challenge people in verse 26 to 37. Let's read that together. Then Elikim, the son of Hilkiah, 
and Shebna and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah, within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said to them, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you, and not to the men sitting on the wall, who are doomed of you to eat their own dung and to drink their own urine? Then that Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine, and each one of his own fig tree, and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his people out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Were the gods of Hamath and Arpath? Were the gods of Sepharphim, Hina and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their lands out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. But the people were silent and answered him not a word. For the king's command was, do not answer him. Then Elikan, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna the Zagari, and Joah the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. Now this is very interesting here, and there's an important lesson here. The officials of Jerusalem seek to get the Assyrians to speak to them in Aramaic. Aramaic would have been the international language. It would have been the language of commerce, the language of law, uh, the language of diplomacy. And it wouldn't have been that commonly known by the average person who lived in the streets. And so what they want to do is get the Assyrians of Jesus to speak in that language, Aramaic, so that the people of Jerusalem wouldn't understand what is being said. They're trying to protect the people from these discouraging words. They're seeking to prevent the people from losing hope by what is being said. And I think, first of all, there's a lesson here for mature believers always seeking to protect, particularly young believers, from discouragement. Particularly our younger believers need that encouragement. We always should seek to encourage every believer we should seek to encourage each other but particularly to avoid unnecessary discouragement and one of the things we need to understand is the Lord protects us from discouragement Deuteronomy 29 29 speaks of how the secret things belong to the Lord but what has been revealed is to his children so you walk in his ways in other words there's things which the Lord knows are too much for us to grasp, too much for us to bear. And one of the reasons why we ask why and we don't get an answer is the Lord tells us what we need to know. And there are things we are better not knowing. If you look going through difficult days and trying situations and you look back and you can be amazed at what the Lord has brought you through. But if you look forward and all these things were in front of you and you knew all, everything you were going to face, it would be so discouraging. So the Lord is very good with us. He, he protects us. We don't need to know everything. This is where childlike faith comes in. And we should seek to protect each other from that which discourages. But the Assyrians here aren't going to give up. They continue to speak in a way that the people could understand. It. They seek to rob the people of their hope. And the the goal here, and the number of times it says, do not listen to Hezekiah, the goal here is to get the people not to trust their leader, not to trust 
their appointed king. And you know, the, the devil goes out of his way that we would not trust Jesus, not trust the Lord, not trust his words, not trust his truth, not trust his care, not trust his love and his wisdom. They diminish the Lord on the one hand and they promise great blessing on the other hand. If you will just surrender to us, you'll have all the what you'll need, you'll have your figs, you'll have your, your vineyards, you'll have great blessing if you will just surrender to us. And don't follow Hezekiah and the Lord. And we need to be aware. Just think of this situation here where these officials are coming, they're speaking to get the people not to trust in the Lord, to surrender to this imposter who's coming in. That is going on constantly in our lives. The devil is constantly seeking to get us to distrust the Lord. He's constantly trying to get the members of your family not to trust the Lord. The people you work with, the people you study with, the people you live among. There's this constant battle for the mind. And what he does is he wants to diminish people's trust in the Lord. He exalts the blessings and the joy, the privilege of sin. That's what he does. And we need to be aware of that. It isn't it the same as Genesis 3? It's exactly the same. His tactics do not change. Wanting people... To have a wrong view of God and wanting people to have a wrong view of sin. And we need to be aware of that. Uh, I think one of the big dangers is these thoughts go through our minds and we just think they're our own thoughts. But the devil is putting the wrong thoughts in there. And the way we respond to that is we have to face these wrong thoughts the truth of God's word the truth of Christ the promises of God that's the way that these wrong thoughts and this falsehood is chased out so I hope we haven't got the really encouraging part yet but I hope that's a help so Hezekiah is threatened his encouraging start his imposing enemy his discouraging visitors his challenged people Amen. Oh,